scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. Hallelujah. When you respect the word of God, when you respect the wisdom of God, your life will remain an unending wonder. First to you, and then to everyone i give you this as a guarantee men do not become signs and wonders just because they are intrinsically spectacular mm -mm. it is their encounter with the wisdom of god their encounter with the word of god they are submitting to the guidance of the spirit show me a man that decides to take god seriously show me a man that decides to take the word of god seriously Show me a man that decides to take the Holy Spirit seriously. Regardless the current situation of that man, I show you a champion, a wonder, a miracle. Hallelujah. Believe what I'm telling you, this is not motivation. Many people desire to be great. Many people desire to be marvelously used by God. Many people desire to ascend heights of influence and greatness and power. And this is the assignment of the house of God, Bethel, the place of bread, to serve you the hallowed bread of the Spirit so that you are guided and shown the way. Jesus said, I am the way. There is Jesus the way. Hallelujah. That leads you to reality, the truth and finally administers life to you so ladies and gentlemen please hear me do not make coming to church just a ritual to ease of guilt no when you come to the house of god be intentional with your heart opened ready to receive one word from the lord can change you potentially but one word from the lord can fall on a soil that is not good and remain impotent like the Bible taught us it is one word from the Lord that is accurately communicated understood and engaged by faith that transforms the life of the individual hallelujah and so your commitment to the house of God is not necessarily just to fill up space your commitment is for your own good it is a commitment towards your destiny and it is proof like our precious people have sung that you love the Lord and you desire to be used mightily by him. You have come tonight, only God can tell the extent of transformation that is about to happen to you. But one guarantee I can tell you is that the version of you that came here is dying here finally. The version that we live is a more superior version, furnished with wisdom not cunningly devised fables not guesswork the bible says listen carefully it says that was the true light that means there are false lights bodies of knowledge that seem to carry power and results but you test them in the face of real life situations and they are impotent but it says that was the true light that lighted every man when it has to do with the true light every man is welcome hallelujah are you ready for tonight one more time father my heart is open go ahead and cry my heart is open i rebuke the spirit of distraction in the name of jesus 
Zari, are you praying? Koinonia Global, are you praying? From every nation, every continent, everyone connecting by television, online, by internet, cry your heart to the Lord as a sign of your desperation. When the word of God comes, liberty comes. When the word of God comes, transformation comes. When the word of God comes, an end to shame and to reproach. An end to age-long captivities come. For in Jesus mighty name we have prayed I believe in Jesus I truly do I believe in his word I have seen his word change men and change nations and that word will change you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ father we give you praise help us by your spirit for in Jesus much less name we have prayed God bless you. Please be seated. On behalf of Jesus, the head of the church, I welcome everyone very specially to church. This is the house of God. This is Koinonia. Hallelujah. Navigating prophetic seasons, part two. We've been on a very deep and prophetic series. We started last week with the sub theme behold i do a new thing and just a quick recap so that we're together we did say last week how that it is important for us to discern prophetic seasons that our lives on earth are fragmented into seasons even prophetic seasons and that our overall excellence in life is predicated upon the ability to discern and then to take advantage of prophetic seasons the entire span of the believers journey is broken fragmented into seasons hallelujah the bible says in genesis 1 14 that he made light to signify seasons and for years and for days and for you know and so on and so forth for signs so there are lights bodies of truth that signify seasons and we said if you are stepping into a new prophetic season it's important for you to know how to navigate your way and we considered for a text isaiah 43 18 and 19 remember ye not the former things nor consider the things of old 19 says behold i will do a new thing now it shall spring forth shall ye not know it i will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert I shared a few thoughts and I want to quickly recap them. Number one, that overdwelling in the past, both negative past and positive past, has an effect in the life of the believer. The Bible gives us an instruction to remember not. Overdwelling in the past negatively creates fear, discouragement, and I said it deflates your passion to press towards the future. When you dwell in a negative past, it can affect you because it can plant fear. It can bring discouragement and deflate your passion to press. And that if you dwell in a positive past, it can bring complacency, pride, overconfidence, and indiscipline. That many people have failed in the future because they succeeded in the present. They so succeeded and overdwelt in the present that the discipline, the confidence, the humility, and the sense of seriousness to press was no longer there. So the Bible says whether the past is positive or negative, there is a measure of celebration or a measure of consideration you should give the past and no more. So remember ye not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Uh, Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter... 3 and 13 and 14 says this one thing i do forgetting the things that are behind i press i press forgetting the things that are behind hallelujah 
and then we consider the fact that the statement I will do a new thing means a new performance sometimes an unfamiliar performance a new prophetic season demands the following number one we said discernment and flexibility that when you are stepping into a new prophetic season it is most likely a season you have not experienced before and it will come in a form and fashion that you are not used to so it will demand discernment and it will demand flexibility hallelujah number two that stepping into new prophetic seasons will demand strength and courage and we took for a text joshua chapter 1 from verse 5 to 7 joshua was admonished he was about to assume a position of leadership he's never had the opportunity to assume at least to that degree and he was mandated by god to be strong and courageous so we need strength and we need courage number three we said that stepping into new prophetic seasons will demand obedience obedience to scripture and obedience to prophetic instructions are we still together yes that you are not able to step in and maximize prophetic seasons except and unless you make up your mind to be obedient to scriptures and obedient to prophetic instructions and we wrapped up yesterday by bringing forth a revelation of the fact that there are five prophetic seasons that God is opening up and it was important for us to discern number one I said it was the season of the harvest that God was bringing before us the season of the harvest massive salvation of souls like never before number two we said a season of abundance of grace manifestation of divine abilities and enablements that will bring forth extraordinary accomplishments in every area number three we said a season of the fulfillment of ancient prophecies national prophecies transcontinental prophecies personal prophecies ancient prophecies as archived in scripture are all finding expression even in this season number four we said god is bringing before us a season of intense spiritual warfare we are stepping into intense spiritual warfare because satan will always fight any season that god is bringing the saints into and we said that the implication of number four was a call for higher levels of spiritual intelligence alongside the grace for prayer the grace for supplication and finally we said last week that we were stepping into a season of rewards where god was going to be visiting families visiting people visiting regions to reward them for their contributions towards his program hallelujah and i'm sure that there are people who have begun to receive this strange order of visitations where god himself is telling men well done thou good and faithful servant hallelujah and so let's get to tonight's teaching we have a lot navigating prophetic seasons part two as a sub theme we'll be looking at god's prophetic agenda god's prophetic agenda i'm going to be showing you by scripture and by the spirit of revelation the sequence of events as they are about to unfold upon the body of christ this is to be able to help you to be positioned and then to be effective as far as your witness and kingdom advance is concerned hallelujah now based on scripture and from eschatology that is the study of end times we know that there are a series of prophetic events that should happen as we wrap up our time upon the earth and the bible lets us know that these events are separated into three there are events that relate to moral and spiritual decline number one the bible says the love of many will wax cold and a number of things so the first category of events has to do with spiritual and moral decline 
the second category of event has to do with political and sociological issues wars and rumors of wars nation rising against nation kingdom against kingdom and yet the bible says that is not even the end that that is only the beginning of the birth pangs the birth pains and then number three we know that there will be um um, economic events and also atmospheric events events that has to do with nature responding in very disturbing ways and all of these events we've seen them in many many dimensions already happening my teaching tonight is not to approach a discourse about God's um, prophetic agenda from you know the uh, standpoint of eschatology my concern is just the events as it relates to the body of christ hallelujah praise the name of the lord but then it's important for you to know that there is a network of events that are supposed to occur back to back concurrently as we prepare for the end of times so let's look at first chronicles 12 and verse 32 first chronicles 12 32 and of the children of issachar the bible says which were men that had understanding of the times to know what israel ought to do so these were men a tribe the tribe of issachar they could discern the times and they knew what israel ought to do the bible says the heads of them were 200 and all their brethren were at their command Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22 when it has to dis do with discussing prophetic events you must be able to have an ear and an eye that is spiritual he said he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith to the churches so there is what the spirit is saying to the world but there is what the spirit is saying to the churches my emphasis as far as God's program is what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Are we together? Praise the name of the Lord. Now, when it has to do with discussing prophetic teachings, because I have taught you here that from a theological standpoint, there are three major layers in study of scripture. Number one is the archaeological slash historic layer. You remember that that when you pick up your bible what you are studying is an ancient material canonized into 66 books are we together as we know so there is an archaeological slash historical dimension to scripture you are reading events past as much as they were documented and as many that could make up the 66 books that we now call the bible of course, you know that there are other biblical texts, not extra biblical texts. There are other biblical texts that were written, some by the disciples of Jesus that did not make it to the 66 books that we know. Hallelujah. And that is a discussion for another time. But the Bible tells us that sufficient for our growth and maturity <clears throat> is these that have been written. Hallelujah. Many miracles did Jesus, the Bible says, in the presence of his disciples, which were not recorded in this book. It says, but these were recorded that you might believe and that in believing you will have life everlasting. In other words, as far as your knowing God, your believing God is concerned, nothing necessarily needs to be added to help construct your understanding. That the truths here are more than sufficient in partnership with the Holy Spirit to help you become a believer with stature, maturity, and understanding. So there is the historic and archaeological layer to scripture. Number two, there is the doctrinal layer to scripture. That means beyond the history, there is a spiritual synergy that connects Genesis to Revelation, and we call it doctrine. The entire text from Genesis to Revelation is about a person about a reality are we together so doctrine is supposed to help you fish through a pathway from genesis down to revelation and to draw a straight line helping you to synergize your understanding now uh, you know from the arrangement of the bible we have the five books of moses we call the torah or the pentateuch and then we have poetic books we have the prophetic books the major the minor prophets are we together then we have the gospels four of them as recorded in scripture then we have the book of acts 
then we have the epistles, then we have Revelation standing alone. So this is how the Bible is generally broken into these subdivisions. And, but regardless how you approach the study of scripture, from a doctrinal standpoint, it then means that every story, every parable, and every detail in scripture was supposed to be unraveled, opened up, and then there should be a spiritual lesson that comes out of it. So when you study Gideon or Abraham or the prophets or whatever it is, there is a doctrinal component. And this is where the, the foundation of the believer's stability anchors upon, doctrine. When you understand the doctrinal construct of scripture, then you are able to navigate scripture with intelligence because the foundation of doctrine that you have keeps you balanced the inability to understand the doctrinal construct of scripture is what is responsible for the vacillations people believe this today believe that tomorrow because they have not understood the doctrinal construct of scripture does not demand creativity it is fixed your assignment is to discover it and communicate it accurately but then there is another layer which unfortunately many people have ignored or rejected through ignorance is called the prophetic layer of scripture this one is the business of you and god because the bible is a prophetic book more than a historic book and more than a book that contains doctrine it is a prophetic book likened to a scroll that can be opened and then whose seals will be unlocked so there is how god will draw forth a message from a verse and based on what he's telling you, it is not within its contextual meaning. God can give you another meaning out of his contextual meaning. I already taught you that and I gave you an example. Let me repeat one more time for your understanding. In Galatians chapter 2, for instance, when you read verse 2, Galatians 2, 2. Please, media, give it to us. Let me just state an example and then we'll continue. Galatians 2 and verse 2. It says, I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which was preached among the gentiles so paul is teaching and from a contextual standpoint he's simply saying i travel to another region and i minister to them that is the doctrinal contextual meaning of that scripture are we together but then when you get a prophetic revelation here like i taught you the first six words can mean something entirely different i went up and i went up by revelation God can use that scripture to now begin to teach you that it takes revelation to accent realms are you seeing now it is from a theological standpoint beyond the scope of that context but it still can minister to you because the Bible is a prophetic material so it is not unusual to find people draw forth revelations from scripture that when you read from a contextual standpoint, you will think they are in error. But the results that show forth from their lives clearly show that it was God that gave them. Now the danger is the prophetic dimension of scripture must never be exalted above and beyond the doctrinal dimension. That is the mistake. So God can give me a prophetic instruction for instance and say, okay, march around this place seven times and reference it with what happened to Joshua. Now, that is not a doctrine. It was an isolated experience as a prophetic strategy for victory. Are we together? Theologically speaking, for anything to be called a doctrine, there are three litmus tests. Number one, that thought or that body of truth must be in the Old Testament. Number two, that body of reality must be captured in the ministry of Jesus. And then number three, that body of reality must be captured in the lives of the early apostles. This is what qualifies any body of knowledge to be called doctrine. I repeat one more time. It must be revealed and expressed in the Old Testament. Number two, Jesus, who is the embodiment of God, there must be a practice, a speaking of that body of truth in the life and ministry of Jesus. And then number three, it must be practiced. We must see it as a capture that was practiced in the life of the early apostles. If it does not pass these three tests, it cannot be called doctrine. Are we learning? So I said that because in discussing prophetic things, 
um, sometimes you will need to be very sensitive. In fact, when Paul was about to mentor the church in Ephesus, he was teaching them. He was about to step into the prophetic dimension of his teachings and he had to take a pause in Ephesians 3 from verse 1 to 5 to explain to them the basis of his confidence so that they would not charge him for error because the things that Paul was about to teach, Jesus did not even teach them in his earth work. Yet Jesus told them, I have many things to tell you, but ye cannot bear them now. So those many things he was to tell them was what Paul was given by the Spirit. For this cause, he said, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, verse 2, if ye have heard of the dispensation of grace, the grace of God, which was given me to you, word, verse 3, how that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery as i wrote afore in few words verse 4 now he says whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of christ last verse now it says which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men are you seeing as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit he's saying i'm about to teach you something that is very complicated and even though i was not a disciple as at the time jesus walked upon the earth do not doubt my confidence i was given it by revelation of the spirit now let's get to our business of tonight there are four major prophetic activities that represent the current emphasis and the focus of god in this season there are four major activities and that will be the basis of my discussion tonight navigating prophetic seasons part two we're looking at god's prophetic agenda the bible lets us know that men can buy into the mind of the spirit men can buy into the mind of god and know the things that god has in store the bible says in first corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10 please give it to us first corinthians 2 and verse 10 and then it says but god had revealed the preceding verses will say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Then verse 10 says, But God had revealed them to us by his spirit. So the spirit of God can help men to understand that which is in the heart of God, even the deep things of God. There are four major activities that represent God's emphasis and represents what God is doing as far as his pro prophetic program is concerned. And it is important for us to know so that you will remain relevant in the program of God. Generally speaking, there are three levels of the anointing. I hope you are learning so many things. I'm compressing so many things in one, but let me have your attention. The Bible teaches three levels of the anointing that the believer can step into. Number one, there is the anointing within that comes as a result of your being grafted into Christ. Are we together? That is the anointing that helps you to produce the character of the Christ in experience. An anointing is simply an engracing from God. So there is the anointing within. It is given as a measure to every believer the moment you are grafted into Christ. Number two, there is the anointing upon the moment you discover your place in God's prophetic agenda, that anointing does not follow you. It follows the office that you represent. Hallelujah. So you can have the anointing within for your edification and growth. The anointing upon is for service. And then the final stage and phase of the anointing is the engracing that comes upon you as a reward for discerning and aligning with God's current program. So it is possible you can have the anointing within, you can have the anointing in honor of your office to serve, but you will be surprised that there are dimensions of spiritual reality you may not be able to touch because of the absence of discernment and the inability to align to what God is doing now. This is the reason why it is important to know what God is doing now. If God is moving right and you move left, you are in trouble. You may not necessarily be a backslider, but you will not be at the focal points, the epicenter of his program. 
So I'm teaching us this so that we'll be able to position ourselves to know what God is doing and then to be relevant. This is a message not just for us as a global family, but also to the body of Christ. Isaiah 40, please, we'll read from verse 9 to 11. Two scriptures I'll show you again. Isaiah 40. O Zion, that bringeth good things, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, he says. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Verse 10. Behold, the Lord will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. The last verse, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd, and shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are young. This is a, prophet, a type of how God speaks to a people. And God is putting it in the prophet, and he's saying, don't keep quiet. Shout it aloud. Let them know that this is what God desires to do. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 27. Matthew 10 27 what I tell you in darkness he says that speak ye in light and that which you hear in the ear thou shall you preach upon the housetops and this is exactly what we're doing tonight are you ready now number one the first prophetic activity that the Holy Spirit God is doing in this season right now is the purifying of the church the purifying of the church the purifying of the vessels the bible calls it judgment in the house of god please write it and then i'll explain the first thing god is doing in his prophetic program in the earth right now even in africa even in our nation across the body is the purifying of the vessels the purifying of the church first peter chapter 4 and verse 17 first peter 4 17 for the time is come he says that judgment must begin at the house of god and if it first begin at us what shall the end be for them that obey not the gospel of god now the idea of judgment as we know in our world always is always associated with chaos destruction but that is not the idea of judgment when god speaks about judgment especially relating to the believer are we together now god's idea of judgment is rather of purification purification unto greater glory not condemnation and destruction every time god speaks of judgment and it is destructive in nature you read from scripture it always has to do with the heathen or believers that have defied his instructions in rebellion and most of these were events that happened before christ the moment christ showed up the dynamics of god's operation with man changed until now are we together so the way that god dealt with people in time past his character has remained the same never to change in the old in the new and forever god is consistent as far as his character is concerned but his modus operandi has changed because jesus has now come as a new and living way there was an advantage that they did not have in the old testament that we now have that advantage is jesus so he has become the deciding factor as far as God's dealing with man is concerned. Never will God ever deal with man outside of the lens of the mediator. Jesus has become a permanent mediator between God and man. Are we together? So that should begin to alter our concept. When we talk about judgment, especially within the house of God, it is rather the purifying it says and in a great house there are all kinds of vessels of gold of silver of wood and of clay it says some vessels are unto honor and some are unto dishonor if a man will purge himself that man will become a vessel unto honor meet for the master's use are we together the purifying of the church in daniel chapter 5 and verse 70 and verse 27 i believe give it to us Daniel 5 27 Daniel was interpreting the writings on the wall and he said for Tekel it meant thou art weighed in the balances and thou art found wanting 
Every time men are found wanting what they need is the purifying judgment of God. Why does God purify the saints? The answer is in John chapter 15 from verse 2 and 3. John 15, 2 and 3. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. But every branch that beareth fruit, he will purge. That's the word there. Purge to the end that it may bring forth fruit. To the end that it may bring forth fruit. Then it says, now ye are clean through the word. How does God judge men? By bringing words to them, words that clean them and reposition them to be more effective. Are we understanding this now? So the first that God is doing across the body of Christ is a, an awakening unto repentance, you can call it, purifying of the church, judgment in the house of God, an awakening that is unto repentance. Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 13 and 14. Ephesians 5, 13 and 14. It says, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Now verse 14, it says, wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give you life. Historically, there has always been seasons where the church may seem to be in a state of spiritual decline. Our generation is not the first to experience such. It's been from the time the church was founded. It's always been a vacillation between fire and revival, spiritual power and energy, and then lukewarmness. And this is simply because the glory of God was put in earthen vessels. And so there is the spiritual wear and tear that comes either as a result of complacency, as a result of persecution. All through modern history, we see that there were always times in the dealings of God with men where men seem to have declined spiritually. And God would send a prophet, God would send his word through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and he will wake them up from that spiritual slumber. And this is one of such times that God is doing the same. All of the cleanings that are going on in the body of Christ, especially the apostolic and the prophetic ministry, is God coming in to say, listen, you can be a better bride. You can be a more furnished bride. I told you that you see from nation to nation, region to region, especially in Africa, there is a lot of purifyings that are going on. Hallelujah. And there are three areas like I have taught you. Please make reference to my teaching, The Purified Church. That is a very powerful revival material that you should keep if you want to do business with God in this end time. The Purified Church. I teach there about the six, um, the six things, problems, issues that are plaguing the church that we need to be purified from. And this is what God is doing. So please do get that material. But the three major areas where God is purifying the church in is the area of number one, moral decadence. Number two, apostasy. And number three, error. These are the three major areas. The church is currently being purified, especially the prophetic and the apostolic ministry. Are we learning now? So anybody who wants to know what God is doing now, I can tell you from the authority of scripture and by the spirit of revelation and by the calling and the election of grace that one of the things God is doing across the body is the purifying of the vessels because there is a demand for greater glory. Are we together? Moral decadence, apostasy, a deviation from the truth and then error. And error is largely as a result of ignorance and imbalance. Jesus said, ye err not knowing the scripture. So erring from scripture has nothing to do with being an evil person. It is usually as a result of ignorance or imbalance. Are we learning now? So the Lord is bringing an awakening unto repentance. Why is this important? So that when the Lord begins to deal with you in such a manner, the devil does not deceive you to be offended and think God is angry with you. This purifying is for the house of God. That means nobody is going to be spared. If you are one who is asleep and in a state of spiritual slumber, he will wake you. 
if you are one who is alive and agile, he will still purify you so that you will bear much fruit. So when it has to do with the purifying of the church, there is no tell them. Everybody takes your bath. You take your bath, biologically speaking, whether you are sick or not. If you are sick, you may need to be managed by some midwife or someone to take your bath delicately. But if you are alive and no matter how energetic you are, it's a matter of a few hours and you will need to take your bath again. Am I right on that? Yes. There are people who love bathing so much, they can bath three or four times in a day. Why? Because of their desire to feel clean. The moment they feel, look, the, I'm, I've, I've been sweaty, I'm not, I'm not in the best position, I'm, I'm smelling here and there, they rush straight to the bathroom. This is what God is doing. And any hard-working man should take his bath too. Is that true? Because the fact that you are hardworking, meaning that you, re, you, you, you are engaging so many things, you are picking up all kinds of things, and when you return home, you want to refresh and be clean, then you can rest. So God is purifying his body, and that is everybody's business. The meaning of that is that you must position yourself and allow God to start pointing to you the areas where he will need you to adjust. And if and when he comes, you must receive it with excitement. Emoji mentality is going to be the cancer of the great in this end time. There is no emoji before God. When you stand before that refiner's fire, your heart must be open. Lord, what is in me that can stop me from accessing the next height in the spirit? And when he points it to you, then you open up your heart. The seven churches, when you read the book of Revelations 1 and 2, the letter that was written to the seven churches, he commended them and then he challenged them, adjust this and that and that, and this is what God is doing. You believe that? Shout a loud amen. amen. So number one, the first thing that God is doing is that he's purifying his church, purifying his bride, bringing what we know from scripture to be judgment in the house of God, and then a reawakening unto genuine repentance and restoration. Can we take number two? Number two. The second thing that God is doing that represents his prophetic agenda, his prophetic program for the now is enlightenment. Please write, there is a prophetic campaign, an abundance of light. God is bringing to bear high level spiritual illumination, enlightenment an upgrade in our spiritual understanding. He's opening to us virgin dimensions of knowledge that we have not known or not known to that degree. This is the second thing God is doing, especially across the body of Christ. Enlightenment, an abundance of revelation. Are we learning? And under this, there are three dimensions of it. Number one, restoration to doctrine. Enlightenment. God is restoring his church unto doctrine. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 13 and 16. Still under point 2, enlightenment. Till I come, he says, 1 Timothy 4, 13, 16. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation and to doctrine. Verse 14. It says, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. 15 now, it says, meditate upon these things. I like this scripture. Give yourself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear unto all. I even love verse 16 better. It says, take heed unto thyself and unto doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Are we together now? So when you neglect doctrine, you will hurt yourself. And unfortunately, if you are a man of influence, especially a man of God, you will hurt all those who hear you because they will be obedient to the error. So God is restoring doctrine, enlightenment, He's helping us to understand doctrine in scripture. Number two, God is correcting the error of imbalance. Under enlightenment, this is the second dimension of what God is doing. 
he is correcting the error of imbalance. For a very long time, the church has been plagued by this, this limitation of imbalance. Truths that are dimensional but not holistic. Hallelujah. I will always make reference to Acts chapter 18 when you read from verse 24 to 28. Acts chapter 18, 24 to 28. The Bible says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, the Bible says, mighty in scripture. What a man. He came to Ephesus, verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. So he submitted himself to mentorship. He was not a rebel. He was fervent in spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. Here is the problem. Knowing only the baptism of John. This knowing only syndrome is what God is correcting. There is something called the whole counsel of God. And this is what God is bringing to the body. I can be an anointed man of God. I can be a great businessman. I can be a great politician. I can be vast as far as the area of calling is concerned. But the truth about it is that I can know only. And I can only teach what I know. I can only mentor within the lens of what I know. So God is upgrading our spiritual understanding across the body of Christ. Acts chapter 20 and verse 27. Acts 20, 27. The full text is to 32. He says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Some versions will say the whole counsel of God. And then it says 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God that he had purchased with his own blood. 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. 30. Also of your own selves shall men arrive, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Two more verses. Therefore watch, he says, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. What a shepherd. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. But you see, contextually, he was speaking about all the counsel of God. All the counsel of God. Colossians 4 and verse 12. Colossians 4 and verse 12. I like this. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayer that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Hallelujah. So God is bringing greater enlightenment to his body, restoring us to doctrine, correcting the error of imbalance and number three which is even most important connecting revelations to divine purpose connecting revelations to divine purpose this is what god is doing what does that mean that the days of having isolated revelations that are not connected to the larger body of god's program will not profit the church so hitherto, we have celebrated isolated, powerful revelations, but they are not synergized to be able to become a roadmap to help us understand God's program. So I can take an isolated revelation about angels. I can take an isolated revelation about prosperity. I can take an isolated revelation about healing. But these isolated revelations in themselves do not holistically profit the believer until they are connected together. Are we together? Yes. 
when you want to get to a destination there is usually a network of several roads you may start and get to a junction then leave that road and connect to another one am i right on that and then you keep navigating your way this is what these revelations were supposed to do so the revelation on prosperity the revelation on character the revelation on angels the revelation of the anointing they were not supposed to dis be discussed indefinitely and left as isolated revelations they are connection points that are supposed to lead the believer through an overall picture of God's program so I can be an expert in eschatology I can be an expert in the matters of the anointing I can be an expert in the area of understanding the angelic and the spirit realm I can be an expert in the issue of prosperity excellence and administration I'm saying that one of the things God is bringing is that he's connecting purpose to revelations so that you don't just pride yourself and say when it has to do with matters of anointing I know what I'm saying when it has to do with prosperity it is me all of those things in isolation will not bring the bigger picture are we together now the person who sells in in our lay understanding now the person who sells rice and the person who sells oil and the person who sells salt and the person who sells gas are we together for your cooking gas now and the person who sells your seasoning and the person who sells say fish all of them are experts in that area but what you need is not the oil in itself what you need is food a delicious meal are we together now so the person who sells oil must understand how to connect with the person who sells rice are we together now and you who wants to prepare that meal must know how to receive the ingredients and combine them well the people who are sitting at the table are not waiting to be served a teaspoon of oil they are not waiting to be served imagine that you, i sit at the table ready to eat you invite me for lunch and then while i'm sitting i see several containers and plates coming one has salt one has dry rice one has oil all kinds of oils olive oil palm oil granite oil the other one has pepper all kinds of pepper and then you say please help yourself make sure you enjoy your meal did you help me because every one of them they are potent ingredients but until the beauty of the meal is when they are combined this is what God is doing are we together so healing why is healing so important prosperity why is prosperity so important consecration why is it so important diligence purpose why are these things important one of the things that God is doing is he's connecting revelations with divine purpose so that the man who is trusting God for prosperity knows why purpose answers the question why if you cannot answer the question why anything you have will not profit you are we together yes I want a car why I want money why I want more anointing why I want more crowd and members why you need to answer the question why and this is what God is doing let me tell you the truth the moment revelation is connected to purpose it sustains the ability to minimize pride because now when you see the larger picture you will not be full of yourself because you know that what you have is just a, a point that connects to another that ultimately leads to God's divine program everything Jesus taught was connected to a divine program even when he taught parables they were not in isolation he would oftentimes call the disciples and connect everything to a bigger picture are we learning now so the second thing God is doing across the body of Christ is enlightenment abundance of revelation an upgrade in our spiritual understanding he's restoring believers to doctrine he's correcting the error of imbalance by helping us to see the necessity of other things and other gifts and other spiritual 
dimensions in the body like I have told you and you've heard me say it many times and I thank God that God is is really achieving this that many believers today have suffered not necessarily as a result of ignorance but as a result of imbalance if I never know that prayer and fasting adds to my overall health then I may sit down there and not grow because I was never taught the relevance. If I've never been taught the, the, the relevance of economic empowerment, I can be a sincere Christian, but I will suffer. Your children will join you suffering. You will become a slave almost eternally and not know why. And you say, God, but I'm sincere. I've served you with all my life. But there is a body of truth that is supposed to bring you into that knowledge. And so what God is doing now is he's helping us as the body of Christ to not ignore any ministry he has sent in the body. Are we together now? Yes. And this is what is gradually coming to the body of Christ. There is a growing appreciation for the diversity of ministries that are represented in the body. And this is how God designed it to be. So that when that happens, the days of superstar Christianity, where certain individuals become like demigods to the detriment of themselves and the body, permanently comes to an end. Are we together now? If I do not know anything about financial prosperity, but I need it, the person who has the engracing when he's teaching, I sit down and take notes with humility, knowing that even though I'm a man of God, if this is not your area of engracing, then you keep quiet and you learn. Are we together? Yes. When the prophetic is speaking, those who are not prophets will now keep quiet and learn. When the apostolic is speaking, you learn. When the evangelists are doing their things, we learn. When we adopt this kind of mentality, in one year, the body of Christ will accelerate more than they have done in a decade. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Are we learning now? So, and then of course, the third one is connecting revelations to divine purpose. This is what will help to also fight carnality and materialism. Hitherto, when you teach, and, and respectfully so, when we teach about subjects like favor, prosperity, increase, influence, because it is in isolation to God's divine program, it does not end up helping the hearers holistically. Because it, it ends up fueling lust in people. So somebody that likes money anyhow, when you are teaching on finances, is giving rapt attention, not because he loves God. He has finally found something that can feed his lust for the weeks that the series will last. But once you connect it to purpose now, a prayer warrior will be listening to a financial series with dedication because he knows he needs it. A financial giant will be listening to teachings on doctrine and prayer and fasting regardless the fact he's a millionaire. Are we together now? Because now divine revelations have been connected to purpose. If you are with me, say amen. amen. Are you ready for number three? No, we're not yet ready for number three. Let me finish number two. I just saw something now. One of the things again that God is doing is he is bringing redefinitions. This is powerful. Redefinitions. You would notice that God is redefining things in the body of Christ. Redefining concepts. Redefining ideas. The things that we have known, God is bringing more light to them. And there are four of them that the Spirit of God has helped me understand. Number one. God is redefining for us the gospel. Most believers have, especially with all due respect, the Pentecostal charismatic circle have largely been in ignorance, in truth, as to the gospel. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. God is helping us as the body of Christ. Historically, the you know, generally with all due respect, what you call the conservative circles have been stronger in terms of understanding the construct of the gospel. The average Pentecostal charismatic can talk about the Holy Spirit, can talk about power and miracles and prophecy, but cannot articulate the gospel. And so this is one of the things that God is helping. He's redefining for us the gospel. He's redefining for us, number two, the Great Commission. It was something we only heard growing up. 
as we became adults, the average Pentecostal charismatic has not even heard of anything called the Great Commission, unfortunately, or maybe in passing. The Great Commission. Number three, he's redefining for us the concept of revival. We have heard revival again and again, but for most people, they have not understood the full import of revival. Number four, the fourth redefinition that God is bringing to the body of Christ is the concept of being a witness. The concept of being light, salt, a witness, an ambassador. Let me repeat this for again. That there are redefinitions going on in the body of Christ. And the first is God is redefining for us what the gospel is. Number two, God is redefining for us what the scope, the entire scope of the Great Commission. And I've done two teachings here that I want you to please listen. Number one, redefining the coming revival. You need to get that teaching and please listen to it. Number two, redefining the Great Commission was a recent teaching. I taught under redefining the coming revival that Abraham alone is not equal to the Bible. The Bible is a combination of Abraham, Isaac, are we together now? Jacob, Esther, Enoch, and that all the players in the Bible, the parallel of them must be adopted and accepted for true and holistic revival to happen. That the revival that is coming will not be spearheaded by men of God and preachers alone as we know. Businessmen have their place in that revival coming. Politicians have their place in that revival coming. Esther had her place. Ruth had her place. Gideon had his place. Elijah had his place. Are we together? The apostles had their place. And so that in the revival that is coming, we need a redefinition so that we are not just expecting Elijah alone. And then we ignore Esther and we ignore Ruth. There are many people, it is a prophetic formation that has several people playing different roles. Some of them roles that have largely been ignored in the body of Christ. But God is bringing an appreciation to those roles. You find that in the teaching, redefining the coming revival. And then under redefining the Great Commission, just to buttress on point two, I thought that there are three dimensions to the Great Commission. Please get the teaching and listen to it. Before now, every time we say the Great Commission, all that we think is evangelism. And that is wonderful, but that is only one over three. In the mind of God, as revealed in Scripture, there is a threefold approach to the Great Commission. Number one, I taught you, is world evangelization. Remember that? Number two is called discipleship. And then number three is called territorial or societal transformation. If we do not approach the Great Commission from these three standpoints, there will eventually be a side effect. Number one, I repeat again, is world evangelization. Number two, discipleship. And then number three, societal or territorial transformation. When we approach the subject of the Great Commission from these three fold parts, will be very, very effective. Now we can do number three. What is God doing? What is his prophetic agenda in this time and in this season? Number three, access to greater and unusual dimensions of spiritual power. I want you to listen. This is the third thing that God, that represents God's emphasis right now. Access to greater and unusual dimensions of spiritual power. Job chapter 2, 23 and 24. The Bible talks about the former and the latter reign. That a time will come when the church, the body of Christ, Joel 2, 23, 24, will experience the former and the latter reign. Be glad then ye children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former reign moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in his first month. 24. And the floors shall be full of wheat and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. Say the former rain and the latter rain. One more time. Say the former rain and the latter rain. 
that means there is going to be an abundance of grace an outpouring of the spirit and engracing upon the saints in a dimension and proportion that we have not seen perhaps in modern history this is true because number one the bible said so and almost all the patriarchs and the matriarchs many of them who have gone to be with the lord they left this prophetic word that there is an outpouring that is coming upon the body it shall come to pass joel said i will pour out my spirit upon all flesh how many all flesh it will affect sons and daughters it will affect old people it will affect handmaiden supposedly ordinary people everyone will be a partaker and a beneficiary of this outpouring so the third thing that god is doing is that he's bringing greater access access to greater and unusual dimensions of spiritual power are we together so god because of this now god is submitting people through intense spiritual exercises to enlarge their capacity to receive this is what explains the kind of spiritual journey that many of us are already having that god is isolating individuals and bringing them into deeper levels of consecration fasting and prayer and you are wondering why is god giving me an instruction to fast one week one month i just finished this one now and he's saying this should be this or for some of us god is waking you up and saying from today up until november once it is 12 o'clock to three o'clock is my time with you regardless how tired you are i will supply grace why is god stretching us this far because there is new wine that is about to be poured upon the body. Matthew chapter 9 from verse 16 and 17. Jesus spoke about this new wine. Matthew 9, 16, 17. No man put a piece of new cloth onto an old garment, he says, for that which is put in to fill it up, take it from the garment, and the rent is made worse. 17. It says similarly, neither do men put a new wine into old bottles so when you see god walking on the vessel it's because of the kind of wine that is coming else the bottles break and the wine run it out and the bottles perish but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved that means if god pours that new wine in your old self something is going to happen to you that may not be a blessing so he's walking on you. He won't stop. He won't stop. Till you look just like him. He won't stop. He won't stop. Till your life looks like him. God is raising mighty men in this time. God is raising people of power in this place. And he won't stop. He won't stop till you look just like him. He won't stop. He won't stop till your life looks like him. Can I tell you, every spiritual exercise he submits you to, do not be afraid. It is for your making. When you watch how oil is being produced from olive, it is not a very pleasant sight. You crush the olive, but in the midst of that crushing, you will see that miracle happen there are some of you because of the new wine that is coming god will stop you from honoring ministrations for months and it will look like you are backsliding but you are in the maker is making you building you building you invites will come and with the anointing boiling in you god will say no the program i have for you will demand a greater level of dealing hallelujah there are some of you in this season god will give you very painful prophetic instructions obtain grace to do it because in that doing there is a new wine that is coming hallelujah are we together yes there will be prayer demands there will be fasting demands there will be all kinds of there will be demands of sacrifice sacrifice of many things that you hold there to you finances especially some of you that like money so much revival is coming 
while it is true that God wants to prosper he will not send resources to a hand that does not know him hallelujah take it down for me one of these my wonderful people sing that new wine song for me where there is new wine David Dam or anybody you know the song where there is new wine I just felt it in my spirit where there is new wine there is new power coming you will see men walk like gods upon the earth I know what I'm saying you will see levels of power that God can trust men with power it's like there are vials in the spirit that have been left for this generation and they're about to be opened and men men will carry power like gods and walk upon the earth power to heal power to speak over nations you will see men empowered prophetically men will speak and literally shift climate over nations this is what God is doing gone are the days where the church will be ignored no their speakings will command their attention to be part of what God is doing I know that our carelessness, materialism, and all of that has brought so much reproach to the church such that when we speak, it's like we have no voice. Because these noisemakers have come again looking for money from politicians or looking for money, unfortunately. That is sad, but there is a resurrection coming up. Mm. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King. Why am I saying this? Your portion of grace is still waiting for you. Mm. Don't keep it a reality just in your dreams and visions. That oil is still looking for you. No other head was mandated to carry it. Kingdom financier, that oil is still looking for you. Prophet of the Most High, nobody knows you now, but the oil is still looking for you. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Listen, do you know when it has to do with this outpouring, there is no age restriction. You will see elderly people that it looks like there are only days for them to go, but the eyes of the eagle will be given to them right from their seated position they will see and direct the younger generation with levels of grace and precision you will see teenagers with character grace and power you will see young men with such level of grace abundance of grace hear me this is very important you must master the revelation of the oil, how oil comes to the life of men. You must know how this happens. Hmm. New wine. The former rain and the latter rain. The former rain. Who told you only men prophesy? You will see women prophets rise. I am telling you. Yes, the Bible says to do it in subjection to the authority of men. 
but you will see women i'm not just talking about people freelancing prophecy women who will stand and speak to nations that governments will uh, will know that this is a vessel of god speaking men and women who will speak his purposes with uncanny accuracy they are men of the altar they are men who know how oil comes from heaven to vessels hallelujah our concept of anointing before now is falling down and shouting but god is redefining it the anointing is the ability to produce god's dimension of results not what makes people fall down did you hear what i said the anointing is the ability and engracing from god upon man that gives you the ability to produce his dimension of results you will see young men that will command wealth i'm saying this to you young men will command wealth that governments will have to call them and say how did this happen i'm not talking of by crooks or pranks by the dignity of kingdom integrity and they will sit in their office and all they are doing is signing checks to mission agencies shining signing checks to to promote the work of god this embarrassing cry about finances that has mocked us there are men and women who god is finding worthy i'm telling you this you believe it i have seen it There are politicians who will double as prophets. They are politicians, but their domain is not, they are prophets, but their domain is not the pulpit, like Daniel. Daniel never had a pulpit to preach, but he was a dangerous prophet. It was with that prophetic insight, he entered the parliament and scattered everything that was not God. Hallelujah. There are men who have no business winning election. God will give it to them because of what he put in them. So that when they sit there, they will begin to receive insight by the Spirit. Can I tell you, you mark my word, you will see ordinary people unqualified in many ways. But because of the God's prophetic program, there is an oil that will come upon them and begin to distinguish them. If you are part of this army, in one minute, open your mouth and pray in the spirit. Lord, I will not be left out. Lord, I will not be left out. Go ahead. Every denomination will encounter this outpouring. I am telling you this. Hallelujah. Now hear me. I had a vision about three or four years ago. I cannot remember now. I was preparing for a program in Lagos and I had a vision. I saw a denomination, I will not mention their name just to honor them, but I saw light. It was, it was like a building that had been ignored, an old building, and I saw light just came and entered that building. And the Lord said, he has brought that light to honor a covenant he had with their founding fathers. That means you will see the most unlikely. Let me not go ahead of myself. Keep praying. Father, I will be part of your program. Access to greater and unusual dimensions of power. Power that produces influence. Power for signs and wonders. Revelatory power. Prophetic power. In Jesus name we pray please be seated and let's continue be sensitive now are you ready for number four so number one the first thing God is doing across the body of Christ is the purification purifying the vessels the church judgment in the house of God and awakening that is unto repentance number two God is bringing enlightenment in a superior dimension restoring doctrine to the body of Christ correcting the errors of imbalance and connecting revelations to divine purpose number three god and god is also bringing redefinitions of the gospel the great commission what it means to be a witness and what it means to experience revival and then number three God is granting us access to greater and unusual dimensions of power. This will demand deep levels of consecration. 
it would demand deep levels of spiritual activities and sacrifices now number four what is the fourth thing that represents what God is doing his emphasis for the now are you ready divine commissionings there are divine commissionings that are happening heavenly callings mandates and assignments that will be given to men divine commissionings John 15 and verse 16 I want you to pay attention to this one please divine commissionings heavenly callings mandates and assignments John 15 16 ye have not chosen me but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the father in my name he may give unto you so the Bible says that God has ordained us to go and bear fruit Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16 Jesus was teaching and here's what he said behold I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves the implication of divine commissionings require wisdom not just zeal most believers have zeal but they do not have wisdom for you to fulfill your God ordained end time assignment the divine commissioning upon your life there will be a greater need for wisdom hallelujah there will be new callings there will be new assignments in fact there will be strange callings i heard this one from the lord that there will be strange callings the lord, the lord revealed to me that there are three ministries we have to beware of so that we do not close our hearts towards them number one that the lord gave me was the ministry of the woman at the well there will be people who would be given that ministry that woman was a woman who was known to have lived all kinds of lives. She had lived a dirty life, five husbands, the six not being her husband. But when Jesus met her, she was her that went to the city and said, come see a man. Let us be careful so that we do not judge this kind of people when they start saying, come see a man. You would say, but are you not the woman at the well? That is the first ministry we have to be careful so that we do not judge. The second ministry, the madman in Gadara. There was a madman in Gadara. All the days you knew him, you knew him as a madman bound in chain, but not when Jesus comes. So if you were not there when Jesus was delivering him, chances are excellent that you will call his evangelism a continuation of madness be careful he may be healed already number three mary the woman who jesus casted seven devils from give us luke chapter eight please one and two holy holy blessed is he who comes in the name of our god holy holy blessed is he who comes in the name of our god please give it to us there was a very strange woman in the bible i don't know why jesus added her to his team it came to pass afterwards that he went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the twelve were with him verse 2 and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities Mary called Magdalene out of whom went seven devils uh-huh the Bible says that they went, I'm not sure that they read that to the end, because reading to the end, the Bible says she came and she ministered and Joanna, the wife, okay, verse three now, of Chusa, Herod Steward, and Susanna, and many others which came and ministered to him of their substance. That woman once had seven demons. What is she doing as part of Jesus' team now? 
ministering to him. There are three ministries if you are not discerning, you will make a mistake of ignoring them. I repeat, when you see the woman at the well with Jesus, do not judge. An evangelist is imagine. Number two, when you see Jesus with the madman at Gadara, do not judge. An evangelist is coming. Number three, when you see Jesus casting out seven devils from this woman, do not judge. He's preparing a mighty army in that person. There will be great commissionings and there will be strange commissionings. You write this down. If you are alive in the days of the New Testament, you most likely would not have received the ministry of Paul. He was not part of those that Jesus raised. This guy just showed up from nowhere and said that an angel appeared to him. God appeared to him. And even Peter and the early church had to look at him. Disappeared for 19 years to the wilderness of Arabia and returned back a solid apostle. And when Peter began to probe his teachings, even Peter began to be intimidated and said, who taught this guy like this? But finally, thank God that a time came when Peter was even hiding away and Paul rebuked him and said, this is hypocrisy. Don't do this. You are the head of the church. And he guided him and helped him. Thanks to Paul, our stability today is with gratitude to the Holy Spirit, but thanks to the courage of Paul. Remove Paul's epistle and see how incomplete your spiritual knowledge will be, even though the teachings of Jesus are there. There will be divine commissionings. There will be new callings and assignments. There will be strange callings and assignment. But in addition to that, there will be an upgrade in current mandates and assignments. There will be an upgrade in current mandates and assignments. That means you will see people, ministers of the gospel, people in the fivefold, and generally ambassadors of the kingdom. Men and women who hear that too would not have had any business with certain assignments, but the Lord is going to be upgrading mandates and granting people access. It's in the Bible that God can upgrade men. God can increase men. Let me show you this. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 16, reading 16 to 19, this is Paul before Agrippa making defense of himself and the gospel. And so he was now reciting what happened to him on his way to Damascus. But rise, he says, and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness. Follow carefully both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto you. Can I tell you? I wrote something very powerful here and I want you to please listen. There is always more to your calling than you initially see or hear. There is always more to your calling than you initially see or hear. That is the reason why you must keep your calling open-ended because there are things God will not show you now. Your faithfulness is what will qualify you to be open to other mandates. If you were Stephen, you would never know that you would be a mighty person. You would just believe that God sent you to the welfare department, not knowing that that was only a training ground. There was still a greater mandate coming. Why does God add mandates and assignments to people? Number one, because of the unfaithfulness of others. Matthew chapter 25, there was the parable of the talent. One was given five, one was given two, one was given one. The guy who was given one brought a great loss to the owner of the, the talents and he said, depart from me, you are a, a wicked and unprofitable servant. And he collected his talent and gave the guy that had first. He never told him when he gave him five that you will have 11. The guy was faithful over 10 plus one added. So you will see people walking in dimensions and callings. If God has given you an assignment, for instance, to build one of the best Christian institutions available and you are careless with that assignment and there is someone who is faithful in what he's doing and saying, Lord, my heart is still open. Whatever you want to do with me, please do. God will take that bishopric and come and give a faithful person. 
Because God will not allow the children who have been mandated to be raised by your obedience to suffer because of your disobedience. He loves you, but he will take your bishopric and give another. One of the scariest things that can happen to a man is to be alive, but not in God's program. Especially if you were once there. It's a different thing that you were not serious initially but that you were once in God's program and then because of complacency can I tell you God loves you but in his program no man is indispensable because to every mandate listen please to every mandate there are destinies connected to it that means obedience is of is of essence every time you obey God there are people and nations and individuals that benefit from it and every time you reject your mandate and allow indefinitely delay God's program he loves you but he loves those who should be saved by your obedience he will transfer that one talent to someone else so you are going to see people go for a, a retreat summoned by God himself and God will say you have been faithful you were just supposed to start with one local assembly but there is somebody who was supposed to be an apostle over certain territories he has indefinitely been careless and unfaithful playing with the intelligence of heaven and right now from his ministry five prophets five apostles five businessmen should have arisen this is 10 years he's still playing i love him and i hope he repents but for now those those prophets and apostles they are still crying in the spirit because there is a mandate upon them can you take this task and you will see a man an ordinary pastor suddenly you will see the certain expressions of graces upon him. You will see men begin certain assignments that you are. Ah, but we were with you 20 years ago. You never told us this was part of the program. And the man will say, I went to God. Oh, and God said, start crusades now in this city. For the next three years, keep visiting this city to do crusades. Some evangelist was disobedient somewhere. And because there is a family that must be saved, there is a man that may have three more years to live and he needs to give his life to Christ before he passes on. And yet there is no evangelist and God can wake somebody. I know you are not educated, but you are available. Go and start something. Let that Baba be saved because he may have been an idol worshiper, but he donated his son to me and I want to honor him before he passes on. If you don't understand spiritual things, you will not know what is responsible for the relocation and the sudden change in men's assignment. There are men who are in Nigeria now. They thought they went to get a job abroad. No, it's a transportation to fulfill a mandate. It's when they arrive there, they will now find out that it's not about syringe and injection. They will be in the hospital and suddenly the healing anointing will be speaking and God will now tell them, I, I didn't want to be so fast on you, but let me tell you the truth. This Canada, this UK, UK is not greener pastures. You came because this city I planted you. There was somebody I was going to send since 2010. And I kept giving. Is it not in your Bible? A parable of someone who he wanted to destroy. He said, no, give it one more year. Give it one more year. Let's see what will happen. Give it one more year. God is merciful. But his program requires urgency. His mercy remains. There are many people today who should not have compromised if a kingdom financier found his assignment and did what he was doing well. Because by now, you should have been strong enough to be able to support the work so that they do not delve into all kinds of things. There is a prophet who would have risen if he was serious. He would have now been crowned with honor to mentor other prophets and stop them from deviating. Every time you reject God's mandate or you waste his time, know that there is a destiny that is paying the price. Only God knows how many families should smile because you, you told God yes. How many children would have gone to a mission school and there discovered their assignment. I will go, I will go, anywhere you lead me, yeah, I will go. Hallelujah. God is too intelligent to give a man an assignment to just get up, become an adult, marry, have children, get a job, struggle, arguing, retire and die. That does not sound divine. 
you must find a divine component in your assignment you must go back and flog it out with destiny lord jesus thank you for the job you've given me but there has to be more what is it for and there are some of you god will speak to you and say mama i gave you four children make sure all those children serve god that is your assignment so mama immediately becomes an intercessor she may never go for a crusade she may not have the opportunity to preach but she will sit down and pray every stubborn child from every club to a church she will pray every spirit out of him until one day from that he will be hearing a crusade from a beer parlor and fire will fall on both him and that bottle and before you know it that guy has been converted and when he tells you his story the mother will say i knew while you were away insulting everybody drunk and roaming around i was praying apostle boy i don't know my assignment start praying start from there let your first assignment be interceding for those who know sow that seed and start interceding for those who have found their place God on Lindsay, you may want to study about him, Christ for the nations. He's gone to be with the Lord. He had a phenomenal ministry. God on Lindsay was a very serious healing evangelist. And the way he started his ministry was by partnering with many people to succeed in their ministries until he finally found his place. Now, there are many people here who, the way your body is itching for ministry, God will never reveal your assignment to you because you are not willing to serve, not to hear God, not to submit to authority, not to listen. There are people, their obsession is just to be general overseer. And God says, I'm too serious for that nonsense. If you are not willing to serve, are we together now? Yes. Just because you saw a vision of you starting a church, I don't know why I'm speaking this, maybe I'm speaking to somebody who is following. It does not mean you rebel against the current system. It's your faithfulness that qualifies you. What you saw is not a lie, but timing is important. You will struggle for the five years you should be mentored until you, are, you punish yourself and then when the five years elapses, you call it breakthrough. Make sure you serve. If you have one day to serve in any man's work, serve faithfully. So that when you leave, a man of God once prayed for somebody who he was releasing. And he said, may God raise men to do to you what you did to me. If you were faithful, you would shout amen kneeling down. Is that true? If you were wicked and you stole and you caused trouble, will you say amen? divine callings apostle i've never had this thing for preaching who is saying you must be a preacher a witness is not a preacher alone but by all means you must declare jesus through your life through your wealth john 1 6 and 7 give it to us this is the universal mandate of every believer as far as being a witness is concerned there was a man sent from god whose name was anything you can put your name there it still fits whose name was john elisha mary please give us verse 6 let me finish verse 6 there was a man or a woman sent from god it doesn't matter what your name is you put it there you are still correct verse 7 the bible says the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him through her through his business through politics through whatever it is might believe not everybody will be on stage like this. Not everybody will be given a global ministry. You can be a pastor that can be trusted with a simple local assembly. And let me tell you this. Use, make sure, let, this is an honest, respectful message to the body of Christ. Respect your assignment, no matter how small you think it is. Not everybody will have a global ministry, ladies and gentlemen. Not everybody will have the opportunity to speak to kings and stand before nobles. If you are Anna the prophetess and you are looking for the visibility of Paul, you will lose your ministry. Hallelujah. There are people who will be sent and may have a membership not more than two, three hundred. A beautiful family church and their assignment is to raise those people. And if you sit down comparing and saying, ah, look at these people, Joshua Selman, around the nation talking with kings, you will be mistaken. It's only when God judges us, you will know who was faithful. 
Are we together? The man who has 50 members and prayed for them when anyone passes on, he's there risking his life. They are waking him and his wife by 2 a.m. No protocol to come and visit him. God is seeing the faithfulness of that man. You are just seeing what about us social media is telling you. It's God that knows the truth of our service. Whatever you want to say, Lord, you can say through me. Whatever you want to do, Lord, you can do through me. Whoever you want to reach, Lord, you can reach through me. Some of you, God prospered you, made you millionaires, gave you business, you became wealthy. The kingdom has not benefited one naira. I respect your sacrifice, but from a divine standpoint, that is mundane. Everything is only measured with respect to its contribution towards the salvation of men, the transformation of believers, and the advancement of God's program. Let me repeat. Everything is only relevant in the kingdom with respect to its contribution to the salvation of men, the maturing of believers, and the advancement of God's program. Apostle, I'm beautiful. Apostle, I'm rich. Apostle, I'm educated. I salute you and I do not downplay your sacrifice. But show me the relevance of that which you have or you know or you do. Let me measure it against souls that are saved. Let me measure it against believers that have been matured and mentored. Let me measure it against the advancement of God's program. In fact, even the betterment of society. And when it has to do with societal transformation, you don't have to be a Christian. You just need to be an adult and educated and humane enough. Are we together? Show me the one child that went to school because of the school fees you paid. And whether you are a Christian or not, I will clap for you. And I will not clap in the secret. Show me a family that was able to eat because God gave you a million naira. Because God gave you a million dollars. You got a contract. Now you have a big business. Yes. In my world, though, I don't clap easily. No. I don't clap because you brought a car or because you brought this. Now, I salute people's sacrifices. I'm not one of those people who downplays. No, if you are anointed, it was not easy. If God blessed you, you are not, it's not easy. If God gave you influence. But I want to see the pro-kingdom approach. This is what commands my applause. My beauty brought five men who like me to church. Now they've forgotten the issue of beauty and they're serving God. Congratulations. May God multiply that beauty. You see it now? I got a job in Shell. And from the money God gave me, by the privilege of God's grace, there's a local church somewhere there. And because of it now, they can hold a revival meeting and souls are saving. Let me see who wants to remove you from that place. Come to me for prayer. We celebrate things in isolation to kingdom and we do not care. I bought 10 cars. I respect it. But what does that mean to God? How many layers of your dead body will be inside when you're not there? I have 50 houses. See, there is a way a believer should think. Please listen. This is church. There is a, a believer should always think with respect to salvation of souls, respect to the maturity of the church, with respect to the betterment of society, and ultimately the advancement of the program of God. You are not a matured and effective believer if this does not define the scope of your reasoning. So if you come to me, generally, I would attend to you, but if you want me to talk to you seriously, these are the four areas. There must be something in your discussion that must be pointing towards salvation of souls, the, maturing, the maturity of believers, are we together? Helping society to become a better place. One day you just drive to a filling station and say the three people behind me having their bikes, I will pay for the full tank of their foil. You don't need to know me. This is courtesy Jesus to you. 
that is mission with 5,000 naira you have made an impact and one somebody in that car will look at you and say you did this for me what church do you attend and he said that's not the issue it's not just the issue of church even though you are welcome I'm just telling you that this is what Jesus produces in people who love him that gospel will be understood are we together you step into a school and say I may not do that for everybody but show me five people here regardless religion I want to pay their wayek fees and those children will come and say thank you ma I don't know you but I've been an orphan I was thinking how I will write my wayek and God will say you did this little did you know that you're an evangelist in the making you thought you were just a humanitarian person one way to know your assignment is to be faithful where you are did you hear what I said? One way to know your assignment is to be faithful where you are. You are in the prayer department, pray and be serious. You are in the ushering department, don't mind those who are pushing you as they are falling under the anointing. God is watching. All the time you hold them and fall with them. One day God decides to lift you. It is beautiful to be able to tell men, I once served like this, like this before God lifted me. Hallelujah. God never reveals the entire blueprint of your purpose for you day one. No matter how clear you thought you saw or heard, I can tell you there is more. Because of the unfaithfulness of those who are not serious with his program for a long time, they elapse their period of mercy as far as subscribing to the assignment is concerned, or the will of man can make God reinvent strategies because he gave man a will. Are we together now? Yes. God gave man a will. This is why his counsel is eternal, but his methods change. If God's method is for you to take a flight to Lagos and the pilot says, I refuse to cooperate with God, God will make another channel available. His eternal counsel is Lagos, you must get there. But the routes to get there can be altered because he respects the will of men. Are we learning? When you say you are a matured Christian, your maturity is based on many indices. Number one, the kingdom compliancy of your thinking. The way you have cultured your thinking and understanding to revolve around the interest of God. That's one of the things that make you a matured Christian. And then the fact that your life is actively participating in this program called Kingdom Come. Not just by preaching alone. There are many ways to be part of it. Again, let me use my kitchen example. You can be, there are not 10 people that will prepare a pot of soup or a pot of stew or a meal. But there can be many supporting people. Someone can go to the market to bring the ingredients. Are we together? Someone can help clean the kitchen to make it nice. Someone can wash or buy the plates. Someone can, there are many ways you can be part of it. Don't tell me I do not know my assignment and that is why I'm not serious. I go to church when I want to. If I feel like feeling has destroyed many people, destiny demands discipline. It's not about feeling. It's that there is a mandate upon your life. For some of you, what you have heard tonight will birth a vision, will birth a ministry, will birth a business, will birth an NGO. Something you have heard tonight, somebody will be a direct beneficiary of what the Spirit of God has said. Everything about your life must reflect his glory. You want to be relevant in this season? You want to be part of God's prophetic program? It is beyond just going to church to clap, shout, sing, cry, fall, stand, carry your Bible and go home. That is wonderful, but there has to be more. You must make up your mind. For someone, your whole assignment is to raise that one child God gave you. Make sure that gentleman grows to become an exceptional leader. But I'm too busy. You see, that's the point. When you know something is your assignment, you will create time for it. Are we learning? Mm. You will create time for it. The songs we sing 
They all belong to you And even the air we breathe It all belongs to you Belongs to you That must be your commitment tonight Belongs to you I have taught you koinonia But let me teach you again Lose a sense of ownership over everything you are and have. That does not mean to be irresponsible with respect to administering and managing what God gave you. Yes, you are an owner, but re with respect to God's program, owners are rebels. We do not own anything. Koinonia belongs to the Lord. It's a privilege to head and steward this vision. Your business belongs to the Lord. Ownership mentality has kept people careless and lazy and unserious. The moment you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2, let a man so account of us, he says, as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Verse 2 says, moreover, it is required in stewards, steward businessmen, steward politicians, steward head of government, steward ministers of the gospel that a man be found faithful so next time you look at that thing you see in your bank account just know that God kept his money with you next time you see the intelligence that is causing kings to come God kept his wisdom with you next time you look at your face and you are handsome and beautiful God kept his beauty with you it belongs to him he only kept it as a steward and as you are mismanaging it be sure he's watching are we together now yes sir he's watching I vowed a vow that everything God has given me and made out of my life without without any sense of negotiation it belongs to him and that any day it pleases him to place a demand on it, believe me, the answer is yes. It's yes that brought us thus far. Yes to everything. Will you empty your account? It's painful, but yes. Will you stand even when you are tired? It's painful, but yes. Will you attend to my people even when you are exhausted? It may be painful, but yes. Yes is a powerful key. It can open you up to the next level of your destiny. He who does this to the least of my brethren, is that not in your Bible? He has done the same to me. The Lord is calling on his body, even in this end time. I want you to please listen very carefully. I have seen many visions. I'm not one person who comes to stand and just shout visions and dreams. I like people to be grounded on scripture and that their, their foundation should not just be I saw or I heard. Their confidence as far as their growth and stability should be on that which is written. Even though in truth, what is written came from I saw and I heard. However, because it's been established and vetted by the spirit and proven all through the history of the church it qualifies to be a worthy reference holy men wrote as they were inspired of the holy ghost you want to be part of god's prophetic program you must make up your mind to stop playing games from today you must take the responsibility of number one being a serious christian a serious Christian is not just one who is always coming to church, even though that is important. A serious Christian is one who has made up his mind to love Jesus, to serve Jesus, and to be part of God's program. Please let me remind you, anything you are and anything you have, if the salvation of souls, if it does not translate to the salvation of souls, the maturity of believers, the betterment of society 
and ultimately the advancement of God's program. I'm sorry to have to use a harsh expression. You are not living, you are only existing. The difference between existing and living is that you are serving a purpose that is larger and bigger than yourself. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Yes. Especially, I speak to my generation. Wake up. Sitting idle and making sure the sun rises and goes down and all you do is gisting, perhaps gossiping, wasting time. I love you, but those days are over. You need to fold that schedule of laziness and spiritual unseriousness and begin to plunge yourself in the larger body of what God is doing. If you cannot preach, pray. If you cannot pray, give. If you cannot give, invite. There's something you have to do and there is something you can do. And from where you are, you can make up your mind I will never go to church alone. It is my assignment. I may not be able to preach. I don't know all those revelations. I cannot connect scripture after scripture, but I can invite three people to make sure as I'm coming to the house of God that I will be part of those that God will use to add daily to the church as many who should be saved. How about being a blessing to your neighborhood? You just go somewhere and buy a pack of indomie and one bag of rice and gather all these children that cannot help themselves and say ladies and gentlemen i have come to do something small it may be small but you take one tear of rice go and tell your mother that jesus loves her and this is courtesy it's not i'm not talking about eye service that the eye service damages the benevolence it doesn't even become a blessing again Train your heart to love. Don't watch people cry and say, it doesn't matter since I'm not the one crying. What happened to your heart? We are like that in our family. It's an attack. It's an attack. It's an attack. There is no body of God. The Bible talks about a stony heart. It talks about a heart of flesh. Is that true? Compassion is the ability to be touched with the feelings of people's infirmity. We are not called to do everything. No, but we are called to do something. Your life must be pro-evangelism. Your life must be pro-maturity of the saints. Your life must be pro-societal transformation. I'm saying this because I'm aware that so many non-Christians follow and listen to me. There are so many Muslims, other pagans, other religions, and I love you. Thank you for following. You have a role to play. That is the truth. If you can make society better, Jesus said, anybody who is not against us is with us. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. The greed of men and the selfishness of men is what continues to multiply the pain of society. Are we together now? God is speaking to you right now. God is speaking to you right now. Have you found your place in destiny? Are you ready for this new wine that is coming? Apostle, but I, I need you to explain something. I've been having visions and in these visions I've been seeing an outpouring of the Spirit. God is telling you that you are part of His program but it, seeing the vision in the dream and writing it is important but it's not enough. You must begin to find out what needs to be done of these Four programs of God, prophetic programs of God, God's prophetic agenda. Have you submitted yourself to be purified, to allow that judgment to happen, to purify your heart? All the anger, bitterness, jealousy, you can't do much for the kingdom with that kind of disposition. Affect my life, breathe on me. Lord, I look to you for life. Affect my life, breathe on me. I look to you for life. Affect my life, breathe on me. Lord, I look to you for life. Affect my life, breathe on me. I look to you for life. Change my life, breathe on me. I look to you for life. Change my life, breathe on me. Purge my life, breathe on me. I look to you for life. Purge my life, breathe on me. I look to you for life. 
So if it is true that the spirit of revelation is coming upon the body of Christ like never before, the spirit of revelation will only meet those who have taken a step of faith to open their Bibles. The step of faith to give God's word rapt attention and to make it a priority is your way of attracting the spirit of revelation. It will not come upon you in laziness, carelessness, and a passive Christian life. For some persons, after this time, you need to go and get all the teachings. These teachings are free. Koinonia Global, you have them. Not just my teachings here, teachings across from nation to nation and you can't put it. Don't say I was there. If you were sleeping, you were not there. If you were punching your phone, you were not there. You are only there when your spirit and your mind is there, not when your body is there. I taught you here that someone can be looking at you like this and yet the person is sleeping. Are you there? No. Or punching half of the salmon. I'm not saying you, but I'm speaking generally. There are people who come to church and it's as if the phone will be stolen from them. From beginning of salmon, this spirit of distraction, they are punching everything, chatting and smiling. No, be serious. Everything God gave man, he gave man control over. The moment it controls you, it is of the devil. Are we together? Enlightenment should find you. I'm giving you the responsibility component now before we pray. So if it is true that Christ is purifying his church, you must yield yourself. Lord, that new wine. Listen for what he will tell you. He can tell you, take a day of fasting and prayer. I want to speak to you. He can tell you, read a book. He can tell you, listen to this message five times. The purified church. Ah, God, but I was there. Listen to it again. And by the fourth and fifth time, you will hear something you did not hear before. Purification is happening. Are we together now? And then enlightenment, revelation. Open your Bible, study scripture, be serious. Don't let a day go by without you studying scripture. If you cannot read it, you can hear it. If you cannot hear it, you can speak it. You can listen to it on the go. Oh Lord, you are bringing unusual dimensions to the body of Christ. I need it as a man of God. I need it as an evangelist. I need that, that kingdom financing mantle. I need that grace for influence. There are many believers who desire several dimensions of this grace, but they are not positioned for it. A respectfully speaking, a dear man once asked me and said, Apostle, what is the secret of making the nations hear you and want you? And I told him, I said, there is a hear ye him anointing. And then he said, can I receive that grace? I told him, I said, I love you and I can pray for you. But even me, I know that nothing is going to come on you. Because the truth is that it doesn't just come by desire. There are preparations of the heart. Have you seen any doctor that sees somebody and on the road he starts performing a surgery? Is that how it happens? There are preparations. Is that true? Yes. They test a lot of things. And there are times they test you and say, no, you are not ready for the surgery now. Go and do this, do this. That's how it is. There are people, the, you want to lay your hands, you know that it's only your hand that is coming on them. What used to back you did not follow you as that hand was resting on their head because there is the preparation of the heart. They only want the influence because of pride or just to show a competitive spirit and God says, no, no. This is what I'm trying to take out of the body. But by all means, ladies and gentlemen, contend for the grace let this new wine not come and meet you wanting please please do you know why i'm saying this because i hate to say it but it is going to happen there will be a divide soon between those who are serious with god and those who are not you are a minister of the gospel i beseech you by the mercies of god to listen to me so that you do not carry needless pain and sorrow and jealousy and anger in your heart. There are people who God will move congregations from their ministries to other places. I hate to say this, but I'm speaking prophetically. And the reason why that will happen is not because God hates them. It's because they have not repositioned themselves 
because of what God is doing now. God loves you, but he does not love you alone. He loves the whole world. So while loving you, he's considering the effect of your carelessness on another believer. And as much as he loves you, he will not let a nation perish because of one person. You want a new anointing? I've prayed this prayer too. He said, Lord, let this new grace come. I wonder what it will look like. We have seen it in types and shadows, but relative to what he is bringing, what we have seen and handled is child's play. Do you not want the grace to cure cancer to rest on the body of Christ? Talk to me. Do you know what that means? I know we all claim we are healing and we have the anointing, but the truth is we know our limits. There are real sick people who have not been healed. And these weightier levels of grace is what will cure it. Do you know what will happen if you really have a provable grace, not once in a while, not by luck, that there is a guarantee? Let's just use HIV and cancer, regardless what stage, that God has been able to trust you with that grace. Do you know how many people will be on their knees to say thank you? This is why I say, you see, when I talk like this, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, it is not usual for leaders to be open and vulnerable like this. Because for many people, leadership thrives on your sense of invincibility. When you give an, an approach that I am invincible. But the truth is that people want to see honesty, even on stage. You see, when you are true and honest, people can forbear. I'm not here to entertain or play games with you. You are intelligent people who love God. God has anointed us, so that one will not deny. But it will be pride to believe that we have attained heights beyond our proportion. Our results still show there are deficiencies. Are we together? This is why there is a corporate call to rise higher. For as long as there is one dead man who we could not bring back to life, for as long as there is one cancer patient we could not heal. For as long as there is one HIV patient. For as long as there is somebody holding a crush and wheelchair. Let's stop bragging. There is still more to do. Thank God for what we have seen. But there is so much more. You only say this if you mean business with God. I don't know about you. But I've made up my mind. That this revival fire and grace as it is landing and positioning myself Lord what will it take to heal nations what will it take to heal kings that somebody comes and they tell you that a whole nation is about to perish because somebody is dying and your entrance into that nation becomes a joy both those that came for the crusade or not people start getting healed in states that were not represented and i'm not talking of this stage manage an exaggeration of miracles and this this nonsense we keep doing no genuine provable manifestations of the power of god hallelujah that someone is sitting and suddenly their hands begin to shake kilometers from where you are and they say, what happened? Jesus has come to town. Something is happening. These are levels of grace that will carry. That kings who may not want you will say, I don't like you, but my consultant told me, I'm an unbeliever, but the only person who can help you is Elisha. Naaman, find your way to Elisha. If it is leprosy, you want cured. There may be many prophets, but Elisha can even say, listen, let him come, that you will know there is a prophet in Israel. Maybe it's my personality. Honestly, I, I've, I've put such a high spiritual benchmark. I don't condemn myself and I don't condemn for what we are seeing. But I know there is such a height we have not gotten to. I get shocked and surprised when I see people celebrating small things. With respect to saying thank you, we should be lavish. But with respect to God's expectation, let's be honest. We are just a step out of the cave. If you are in ministry here, please listen to me. Don't be too quick to start celebrating two people were healed. Thank God with respect to relative to how many. When I'm praying for the miracle service and crying, I say, oh God, please. Not even for my sake, for the sake of the people. Let nobody come and go back. Let it not just be that, that people are clapping and saying, man of God, you are anointed. Thank God for it. But there is more. There is more is the language of champions. There is more is the language of men. And thank God for what we have seen. Thank God for what we know. 
the little that he has shown us here but there is a vast there is a storehouse of revelation waiting to be revealed to the body lord will you open the scrolls for me again i'm planting a hunger in you so that even while you are great your contemporaries and those who look up to you will be saying you are a champion. What are you still fasting for? What are you still praying for? By the way, it would take us a lot. You know, let me tell you, members are lovely people. May God bless you in Jesus' name. But you see, one thing I've learned, human beings can so flatter. You will be preaching with gaps in your understanding and they'll say, my God, I've never heard this. <laughs> Let's tell ourselves the truth we have tried worthy of commendation but the a thousand cubits has been measured again and God is saying it is time where one meeting will make headlines in a secular news station not because they love God but because it will be unfair that news is so loud it cannot be quiet go and read about the wealth revival I'm not talking about going to pay radio stations to do things, no. But that people say something happened in Nigeria and in one week, there was 10,500 cancer patients proven that were healed. With doctors, both Christian and non-Christian saying, these are the records before and after. Come on now. That is too, that is too spectacular to be ignored. Are we together? Yes. 500 women trusting God for the fruit of the womb with triplets. 500 triplets. Abba. Are we together? Yes. You see, the end of all arguments is results. And this is what we must pray for. Are we together? That in one week, 1,000 people without jobs because of yokes and curses that have sat on their destinies. That because of one genuine encounter, they encountered a man who had encountered God. And because of that, with one prophetic of trans, may God open your doors. That we come for testimonies and we have to cut it and say, please go back. Because there are people with their records. To say I was sitting down on a job I applied in 2010 that the man said an angel came and dropped your CV on his table and he looked at it and said ah, ah, but this thing has been long and they called you not to give you a job but to make you a manager and immediately you employed five others look at that kind of testimony how does it sound in your ears evangelism is not hard the result to back it is what is not there did you hear what I said evangelism is not hard the result the potent result to back it is what is not there body of Christ thank God for what we have done thank God for what we are doing we cannot ignore what God is doing he is doing great things in us but I can tell you there is a greater demand the darker the night the greater the light your touch light is light but not light enough to turn a room into light so our little little touch lights here and there we thank God for it it's better than nothing but there is God is calling us again there is a mountain of the Lord this is my sermon tonight God is saying it may not be everybody but who is ready to give me your hands let me take you up a mountain in the spirit and show you what I showed the patriarchs and show you what I showed Elijah what I showed Joshua I want to show it to you call on to me he said and I will answer I will show you great and mighty things I don't know who is ready to join me in that journey but as for me I'm not stopping there is no plateauing no plateauing whatsoever we will pray we will fast we will cry we will travel we will study we will learn we will submit ourselves to his dealings until genuine grace from heaven the grace that turns you to a transgenerational blessing are you praying already or should i give you a prayer point someone should be provoked already to say lord I desire you to see your power and your glory. A man of God is praying already. A politician is praying. A businessman praying. 
a captain of industry praying, a parent praying, a young man praying, someone who knows that he can be used by God is now praying and saying, Lord, let me find mercy in your sight. There is more that needs to be done. 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 We need to bring the nations to the Lordship of Jesus. And this will not happen just by making noise. This will happen by partnering with the Spirit, knowing what He is doing in this season, releasing ourselves wholeheartedly with unwavering devotion until we see His glory and His power revealed and manifest in our lives. Go ahead and pray. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are king. One more time. Yes, the world. Yes, the world. Yes, the world. Yes, the world. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God our lives and through our witness every man will bow down and say you are king so let's start right now why would we king of glory That is the realm that produces power. King of glory, fill this place. Just want to be with you. Just want to be with you. One last prayer point and I speak over you. Father, whatever it would take to be part of your prophetic program, I yield myself. Go ahead and pray. Whatever it will take to represent you, whatever it will take to serve your purposes with my life, whatever it would take to be trusted by you with power, grace, wealth, influence, glory, revelation, whatever it will take, I yield myself completely. Go ahead and pray. Whatever it will take to represent you in politics and governance. Whatever it will take to give me influence for the sake of the glory. Whatever it will take, oh God. Go ahead and pray. One minute, stretch in the spirit. Let it be a cry of desperation coming from a yielded heart. Someone pray. Someone pray. A desperate cry from your spirit.
I know God has used you to prophesy, but pray there is still a higher dimension. Dear prophet of God, there is a higher dimension that you have seen. Dear apostle of God, there is a higher dimension. Dear businessman, there is a higher dimension. Dear politician, dear man of influence, captain of industry, kingdom financier, there is a higher level of trust. A thousand cubits can still be measured and given to you. Dear prophetic psalmist, thank God for the songs you have brought, but there are still songs in the spirit yet to come that will be apostolic and prophetic ladders for us to climb. Dear evangelist, you have seen souls saved, but there are many more to be saved. Someone pray. Grant me grace to remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old, the spirit of complacency, arrival mentality, every pride and vain glory. Let it be drained out of my life that I will be left with one pursuit and one pursuit alone higher dimensions to see Jesus to encounter his power to know his glory even the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe yes the world will bow down and say you are God even through our witness, every man will bow down and say you are he. That is our prayer tonight, oh God. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are he. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? We can praise you now in victory. King God, Lord. That is the song of a generation that desires to see an outpouring desire to see revival the gospel penetrate nations and nations one more time king of glory feel this place Hallelujah. Let this prayer be your prayer point for this week. When you wake up in the morning, beyond praying for tea and bread, beyond saying, look upon me, put fuel in my car, I'd like you to cry and say, Lord, to be part of your program, reposition for this prophetic thing you are doing. Use my life. Use the brain you have given me. Use the influence you have given me. Let souls come to the kingdom through my life. Let the church profit from my life. Let society profit from my life. And ultimately, let the revelation of Jesus and the glorification of the same, the advancement of the kingdom, let that be true in and through my life. But you see, that decision cannot be true if Jesus is living outside of your heart the first step to making this decision true is to see to it that the king of glory the one who you just sang about he's finding and looking for a space in your heart he said behold I stand at the door of your heart and I knock if any man heareth my voice and opens that heart I will come in and sup with him and he with me even though he was speaking to believers that also applies to unbelievers Tonight, Jesus is calling on as many who are saying, Thou son of David, would you have mercy upon me? I want to repent of my sins. I want to make my ways right with Jesus. 
I want to be part of the prophetic program that you have for the nations. I don't know where you are, but I want you to know there is a man of God in you. There is a woman of God in you. There is a champion in you for the kingdom. I'm going to make a call one to five. Wherever you are, you want to make this decision for Jesus. Don't be ashamed and don't be afraid. I want you to run like there's fire on the mountain. As I count one to five, everywhere, all of the overflows respond to this call. This is a call of destiny. Jesus is calling. Don't look at who is coming or who is not coming. That is not your concern. Yours is to make your way to the front. Unashamedly so, leave everything that you came with and come to Jesus. You came with family, but this decision is for you alone. You came with your husband, your wife, your children, your parents, but this decision is for you alone. Came with your business partners, this is alone. You are watching by television as a family, but this is a personal decision. Watching from anywhere across the globe is calling you. Come. Be part of this mighty army that he seeks, young and old, male and female. Come. Three, I count five and we begin to pray. If you're coming, please rush. Come to Jesus. Let it be known to you, O Israel, that the same Lord you have crucified, the same Jesus, has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. I salute you. Thank you for winning that war. Thank you for your courage to come to Jesus. He says, as many who will come to him, he will in no wise cast away. Hallelujah. Thank you. Lift your right hand if you can. Those of you in front, some of you are crying. Don't be ashamed of your tears. This is what happens when you come to the house of God. He loves you too much to leave you the way you are. And he's extending his love and his fatherhood. It is because he loved you so much that he did not even spare his son Jesus. To see to it that he gives you a new beginning. No matter what you have done or not done, no matter how your life has been or not been, he's ready to give you a new beginning. One declaration with faith and understanding is all it takes to begin this journey. Whether you're rededicating your life to Jesus or making a first time decision, please say this loud and say this clear. Lord Jesus, tonight I have heard your word. I believe you with all my heart. And I receive you right now into my heart as my Savior, my Lord, and my King. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is broken over my life. From tonight and forever, I am a child of God. I go from glory to glory and grace to grace amen keep your hands lifted father thank you i declare their sins forgiven by the authority of scripture and lord i know that you are giving them a new beginning in the name of jesus the old is gone and gone with its pain gone with its disappointments gone with its failure jesus has come to give you a new beginning and i call you bona fide recipients of the life of god the power to live victorious Christian lives, I impart upon you. And then I commend you to the ministry of the word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that you be grounded and established in righteousness to the glory of the name of the Lord. For in Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. A big congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much. Please, I'd like you to make your way to my right, which will be your left. To my right, which will be your left. There are counselors who will have a quick word with you just to appreciate you and then to have a word with you. Koinonia, let's honor them very quickly. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So let me encourage you as we wrap up the service. Oh, by the way, I promised to make a special announcement to myself, so let me honor that promise. Tuesday and Wednesday I'll be in Lagos but here's the point I'm visiting a church New Heritage Baptist Church and let me tell you a little story about this church when God started 
using us and helping us. We used to organize a program there in that church, beautiful family church. And these were people who believed in us even when we did not have all that the world is celebrating now to the degree that they see. These people believed in us and invested in us and um, God has granted grace to just visit them two days, Tuesday and Wednesday. So I'm encouraging all who are in Lagos, let's meet at New Heritage Baptist Church. Let's support the church. Let's encourage them. I'll be there myself and I want to see you there. Gather yourselves and let's go. Help me tell them thank you and let's share fellowship together. And so I'm making this as a personal announcement, please. All those who are in Lagos, I'm in Lagos Tuesday, Wednesday, the media will put, um, you check our social media platforms, the address will be there, it's New Heritage Baptist Church, and make the sacrifice to be there. Let's have the time to pray. I'll be sharing on the mysteries of the kingdom. I'll be praying for the sick, ministering to the needs of people. But more than that, I want you to come and join me as we honor these noble people who believed in us, even when the world had not seen us to this degree. We owe them our honor, and so I'll be there on Tuesday. Hallelujah. And thank you, all of you who have made the time to be here tonight, especially um, our guests and visitors. The Lord truly bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I saw a bishop. I'm, I'm not sure that I know him, but we honor you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for worshiping with us. May the Lord honor you. We appreciate the time you have taken to worship with us in Jesus much less name we have prayed let me speak over your life now why do we speak the prophetic blessing as we wrap up it's not a way to close the service It's because prophetic words are very powerful if you believe them and receive them they produce in your life let this week be a week of wonders for you in the name of Jesus may you be a living witness of the mercy and the faithfulness of God this week I declare for all your loved ones who are not saved, let this be their week of salvation in the name of Jesus. And every long-standing issue in your life, may the God of all grace visit you on it this week. Let me speak over your finances. Let favor from Monday till Sunday, let it follow you. From Monday till Sunday, let it follow you. This week you are marvelously helped of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Every helper that must appear in the name of Jesus before the weekend, they already arrive. You will not die. You will not cry in the name of Jesus. Anyone plotting evil for you like Haman, their evil will come upon them in the name of Jesus. And for everyone who has been praying that God will bring someone for him to bless, may you be the one God puts in their mind. In the name of Jesus. Your prayer life will not go down. Your word study life will not go down. Your passion for the things of God is increasing. Your testimony is increasing. Your witness increasing. You walk in health and vitality. By this prayer, I curse every stranger in your body. In the mighty name of Jesus. And I place a mark of touch not upon you. I decree and declare, no satanic force will come near your dwelling. For your sake, your family members who are not here are blessed. Everyone who sees you will know you are a Christian indeed. Signs and wonders will be produced through your hands. And as you return next week, you return with marvelous testimonies. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Give Jesus a big hand clap. Hallelujah. We'll share the grace in fellowship. Please make sure that you invite as many people next week. Tell them that the fire of revival is burning and the Lord is calling on as many who must be part of his program and then we are committed to teaching and helping you to see and to know the truth. As for now, may God bless you one last time. In Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. After the grace do well to hug and greet someone on your way out, let's share the grace in fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely. Hello. Scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs. It says, My son, attend to my sins. Incline thy ears to my words. Let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well. That you will keep these words in the midst of your heart. That no matter the circumstance, your eyes are going to be fixed on these words. And as you have been blessed, we will tell you to share this message. Be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed. And then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos. We have loads of content that is going to make you blessed. That is going to set you on course. That is going to set you ablaze. And don't forget to like for us. Thank you.